video 5, the active third toes and upper halves of the insteps. So what are you doing? Do you often wonder why you do certain things? Why you feel like doing things and don't feel like doing things? This goes back to our memories, our belief systems. Why do we do it? This comes from experience. We've experienced things in the past that we like and dislike. So that determines what we do in the present. How well do we relate to what we're doing? Are we able to make it work for us? And of course, there's that familiarity. And sometimes we have to redo things. We are now looking at the third toe. The third toe is the doing toe. It's all about the actions and reactions. And this is related to the upper halves of the insteps. It's all about the incidents and the adventures of life that we go through. The more we do in life, the more we learn. The less we do, of course, the more static we become. Everything is everything else. So since the third toe is related to the digestive tract, we can also see reflections of the digestive tract and its effect on the third toe. Because, of course, this is mirroring what we are doing and not doing throughout the body. So we create a hunger for things that comes from the mind. Our muscles express what we wish to do and don't do. They help us move ahead or they pull us back. The eye reflex in the third toe is connected to the adrenal glands and the courage to get on and do things no matter what is in sight. The color of the third toes and the upper halves of the insect resonate to yellow. Yellow and the element of fire. It's all about the actions and reactions. The digestive tract is all about how we process life. This is the one that the yellow toes resonate to the most. It's not just about the digestive tract though, it's all the areas in yellow throughout the feet. Because everything we do affects how we feel, how we communicate, how secure we feel. We look at every aspect when a person is having a challenge about what they should do or shouldn't do when we do reflexology or reflexology. Being the fire element affects the temperature of the body. And it's quite possible to have one very hot foot and one very cold foot. And it really depends whether it's past or present future. Because whatever happens in the present affects the future. So for example, if it is a cold foot in the past, it's going to affect the whole body. Why is it cold? Often people blame it on the blood circulation. But then why is the blood circulation chilly, for example? What has caused it to be cold? So what is going on in that person's life? Are they pulling back from what they should be doing? Are they giving the cold shoulder? What is going on in their life? On the other foot, I was just going to say the other hand, but on the other foot, it could be boiling hot because what has happened in the past, they're now furious and frustrated about, and that is coming through on the present. So with the third toe, we don't just look at the toe and the upper digestive tract. We also have to take into consideration that it's up to the mind, the hypothalamus, that tells us when we're hungry. But the interesting thing is, what are we hungry for? Food and what we do are related. When we're really enjoying what we're doing and we're feeling fulfilled and satisfied, we don't really need to eat. But when we're bored and unhappy, we need to fill the gaps. Think about going on holiday. What is one of the things that people do on holiday? They tend to eat more, do less, and not always very satisfied. Satisfaction doesn't come from food. Fulfillment doesn't come from food. It comes from what we do. Food highlights how we are taking in life, how we're taking in the experiences of life, processing and digesting them. So we can learn a lot from food, and we'll have a look at that later. So going back to what I was saying about hunger, what are we actually hungry for? And which part of the body picks that hunger up is the hypothalamus in the brain. So when massaging the brain, the hypothalamus will already have been massaged. Then we refer to our feelings. What do I feel like eating? And that again will determine the type of food we take in. Will it be a comfort food, a nourishing food, a refreshing food? What type of food depends on what we are doing? We then take it back to our brain and make a decision of what to eat. The teeth are the decision makers, and of course we take the food into our mouth, which comes under the 
communication relationships. We then chew it over, and as we chew it over, we're making up further decisions. And of course, saliva comes into play then. Then we take it down and we swallow it through the esophagus, and this part is the expressive part of the body. So if we're not really expressing ourselves, then of course we're going to choke on our food. But we've already sorted that out through the toe next. The next area that the food goes down is the esophagus, and that passes through the emotional area. And this, of course, will depend on the feelings, because if we're feeling very uptight and tense, this is going to restrict the esophagus. Now, I was speaking earlier about how everything is neutral until we interact with it. We are neutral when we wake up in the morning. Food is neutral. And it's our belief system that we label that food with that will change the energy of food. So if we believe that food, or even drink, is good or bad for us, our whole body chemistry changes, and so does the energy of that food or drink. So if we believe something is good for us, it's going to be a totally different energy to something that we feel is bad for us. Our body will start tensing the moment we think something's going to be bad for us. The body starts relaxing when it believes it to be good for us. There's so many aspects to taking in food, and it all revolves around what we are doing with our lives. So now we are down in the upper digestive tract area, which is reflected onto the upper insteps. The worst is getting off on the wrong foot because it influences the next step and the steps to follow. But we can correct that too. The color yellow is a very energetic color. And the more we do with our own ideas, the more enthusiasm we put into life, the brighter the yellow and passion becomes. When we are not being our authentic selves and getting on with what we came to do on this planet, then, of course, our energy becomes exhausted. We complain of being tired. Tired of what is the question? People never finish the sentence. The other aspects are that the body becomes very tense. We can develop phobias. There's often insomnia because of playing around with concern in the mind. Our body is telling us that there's something else that needs to be done. Concentration becomes poor. We tend to get addictive personalities because we're trying to replace what is missing in our life. We often become very self-centered and we become fearful and have manic depressive behavior. Competition arises when a person is not really on track with what they should be doing. And then, of course, comes the frustration and the insecurity. The third toe and the upper insteps are also connected to the nose. The nose points us in the right direction, and things get up our nose when we're irritated. We use our nose to show our status. Often we're a snob, or we put our nose in the air. The nose is our self-recognition, and we recognize ourselves through what we do. It's not about other people recognizing us. That will never satisfy us. We have to satisfy ourselves and fulfill our mission in life. When we are not feeling satisfied with what we are doing, our nose gets irritated and it will constantly dribble. Mucus is formed in the body to get rid of any irritants. And in this case, it's irritation about what has been done and not been done in our lives. Those who are perfectionists in life tend to get sinus issues. They get up their own nose. Things have to be done so perfectly. But then at the end of the day, what is perfect? When we're massaging the nose reflex, we're also massaging the adenoids. The tips of the toes are the reflex points for the sinus, and it helps clear the head and also clear the nose. Also linked to the third toe and what we do are our ears. Whatever we hear influences what we do and don't do. So, for example, if we hear that Africa is a dangerous place, hello, I live in Africa, then of course many people will not come and visit. What a pity! They're doing themselves such a disservice. But it's not just coming to Africa. If we hear that something's dangerous or bad, are we going to go there? No, but then we haven't experienced it for ourselves. Many of our belief systems are based on what we have been told, what we have heard from our family. And that is why the air reflex goes from the little toe, which is the family society. So we initially hear things from outside, what is going on in the society. We then run it through the air, and if it's going through the toes, 
the air reflex goes through the communication relationships. Depending what's going on in the communications and relationships going to affect how we hear things. Then what we are doing, because now the air reflex goes through the doing toe, the third toe. So what we're doing and not doing is going to influence what we hear. And then it goes through the second toe. And our feelings are then going to affect what we hear. It ends up on the big toe. So the big toe is ultimately going to decipher, with the help of the brain, what we are hearing, and it will then determine what we're going to do or not do. This is a kind of hectic chart. I love it because it's so full of life and energy. And it's just got all the various parts that are connected to the third toe. It just shows that the more passionate one is about something, the more it comes alive. Or oh, it can actually be mind-blowing. It really depends on how a person receives it. And that depends on what's going on in the other person's life. Whatever we do, it's important to follow our heart and soul and not to worry about other people as long as we're not offending them or hurting them. If they take what we are doing at authentic level badly, then that's something that's going on in their life. And we are just being the agitators that are helping them to sort something out for themselves. So I could be here and I could share all this information <coughs> with you and I would be absolutely bored out of my mind because I am fed up with what I am doing. Have you noticed the lack of passion? Passion brings things alive. The word passion, pass I on. So if we're going to do anything, let's do it well. A job worth doing is worth doing well. And when we do it with passion, then other people become inspired. And that is what we're here for. We're here to help one another, give each other a helping hand so that they have the courage to be themselves, to get on and do what they came to do. We've looked at the word battle before. When people battle to do things, it becomes a battle within the body. If you look externally at what happens in war zones, then that is what's happening in the body when we believe we have a battle on our hands. Be aware of how you tell other people about what you're doing with your life. Put a bit of enthusiasm in it. When people say, how are you? Fine. Yeah, that says a lot, doesn't it? I'm feeling amazing. No, I'm not. I feel fabulous, amazing, incredible. Try some of those words for a change. So when it comes to battling to do things, we tend to lower our standards. We tend to lose the plot. And therefore, our body does not know what to do. It doesn't know how to function. And then it starts malfunctioning because of this internal battle going on within. There's a lot of sickness in this planet. But what are we talking about when it's sickness? Just as I said, when we're talking about being tired, the question is, tired of what? When it comes to sickness, sickness of what? Of the routine? Does it make us dizzy because we're going round and round doing the same old thing? Or are we tired of being the bridge between other people? That makes us uneasy and illogical. Are we sick of our loved ones? And that makes us feel lousy. Are we sick of our work? That can make us vomit. The body vomits when it needs to get rid of anything that is not working for us. It becomes nauseous beforehand as a warning. Are we sick of our acquaintances who are unreliable? This makes us queasy. Are we sick of our family and feel vulnerable? We need to make the difference in our life and change what we are doing. We choose our profession or our work or occupation with what we need to work out. We chose our families because they have the same issues as us. And those issues show up in the tissues. When we do a job, we are working through those issues. We are processing. We're using food to help us, but we're processing what is going on at a deeper level. And food will also highlight what is going on. So, for example, when a person chooses to be a judge, maybe they were judged a lot as a child. And now they need to be in a position of judging others and see how it works for them. Then, of course, there's being a teacher. What are we teaching? 
I don't call myself a teacher. I don't call myself a lecturer. I cannot teach another person anything. I am a presenter. I present the information. If you like it, great. If you don't, think again. And then, of course, I spoke about nursing and the nursing of emotional wounds. What I found really fascinating was when I was in New Zealand and I had this beautiful doctor who organized my workshops. She invited me home for supper and her husband, who was also a doctor, was very skeptical. So as I walked through the door, his feet were waiting for me and he said, there, read my feet. Tell me what they're saying. And I just went, oh, and he said, see, I told you, this is a whole load of rubbish. And I said, no, no, no. What I see on your feet, you don't normally see on men. And so that gave him a fright. And then I said, it's a little cut I can see just above your heel, which is where the uterus reflex is, which is why normally you see it only on women. And he said, oh my goodness, because the uterus is also reflective of the home. His mother had cut him out of her life when he was two, gone away from home. And his profession was gynecologist. He was cutting out the wounds. We become addicted to certain things in life when they are lacking in our life. We try to substitute the external world for what is lacking internally. Drugs are highly frowned upon by society because a lot of people who are drawn to taking drugs are not able to express their ideas. Often, they are very highly evolved souls who do not fit into the very limited social belief systems. The drugs take them away from socially created circumstances. People medicate themselves to numb the pain. They don't want to feel the hurt. And yet the pain is telling them that something is desperately wrong and needs to be dealt with. Another way people do this is cigarettes. They are a way of swallowing emotions, also of creating a smoke screen. They are fearful of showing their feelings. Food is often used to hide or obliterate problems. It often replaces what is craved, particularly love. Then, of course, there's the alcohol. Alcohol is not good or bad. It's whether it's used to drown sorrows or celebrate life, just like the reason why we eat certain foods. Then, of course, there's the financial difficulties. Why are there so many financial difficulties on this earth? because people are not valuing themselves. They're not paying interest in their soul desires. They're not appreciating their many, many talents. And so they're trying to substitute it in other ways. The moment they appreciate the abundance they have within, then they will find the abundance externally. Many people have cancer cells in the body. These cells form when there's a lot of anger and frustration that has been contained. If it grows out of proportion because of being constantly fed by the poor me attitude, it will distort the cell. What will happen, the more that the frustration is fed, the more the abnormality within the cell grows. It's like anything we feed. It will grow and grow and become a threat. So cancer is not good, it's not bad. It's just an indication that something uneasy is going on within. Again, Remember, are you battling cancer? Are you suffering from cancer? Change the words. Embrace it. Embrace it as a part of you that is not happy. It's craving attention. It's reaching up for your love, your support, so that you can do something better about your life. And some of the most amazing people develop cancer. They're often the nicest people on the planet because they won't tell you to go and jump off a bridge. So instead, they create a turmoil within them. There are so many people who have cured themselves from cancer. Reflexology and reflexology are fabulous to be received during cancer treatments. One of the organs of the body that gets a really hard time is the liver, and yet he's such a lively little fellow. So what is really going on with the liver? Now, everything we do in life, especially for the first time, is experimental. And once we've processed that, the energy goes to the liver. It all depends on the energy we are putting into what we are doing. Because the liver is breaking down the red blood cells that carry the love and joy around the body. 
and nurtures all the other cells. Then the liver, once it breaks it down, can only extract what the red blood cells present it with. So when people say, I have no energy, I wonder why. It's because they have not put the energy into what they are doing. You cannot take energy out of lack of energy. You have to put energy in to get energy. And that is the lot of the liver. As a society, we're very good at labeling things, particularly things like food. And people tend to look at those labels and see what are the contents and what is going to be good for them, what is going to be bad for them. If they paid as much attention to what they are doing and put as much enjoyment into their actions, their life would be so much better. The thing is, we all label at some stage of our life. I was labeled a fairy elephant, sausage, Tintin, any of those names. And of course, nicknames have an impact when you're growing up. And we tend to grow up with those labels. It's losing the labels that can be a bit challenging. And not everyone is going to be living up to those labels all the time. All us ladies can be a bitch from time to time. We can go from angel to bitch in three seconds flat. So when it comes to being labeled, it's what we buy into that's going to affect us. If it doesn't matter, it won't affect the matter. If it matters, then it's going to affect how we deal with life. Then there's that fear again. Frightening experiences, aggravating reality. We have the tendencies to internalize our reactions and hang on to them. And of course, that then feeds the cells within the body. We internalize our reactions according to what we buy into and give attention to. It actually influences our decisions. If we keep feeding ourselves the same old, same old story, then of course it gets very, very sterile and we can't do anything different. And then there's the stomach. Now, the interesting thing is that the liver is on the right side of the body. Now, if you remember, the right side of the body is the past. It's very much influenced by the male energies. And this is where we do all our storing. In the case of the liver, storing our experiences. The stomach is on the left side of the body, very much influenced by the female energies. And the stomach is what processes life. Once we've taken in food, i.e. our life experiences, chewed it over, swallowed it, it then goes into the stomach. And it's up to the stomach to determine what it's going to do, how it's going to stomach the situation. It has mechanical, physical movements. And what these do, if a person's very angry and frustrated, the stomach will start being very ferocious in its movements. The amount of gastric acids will also increase because the more acidic and bitter we become about what we're doing, more resentful, the body produces more. And this is one of the areas that releases it. This makes it very hard for the food to be digested easily. In fact, what it does, it brings out the worst of food. It breaks it down. Instead of drawing out the nutrients, it actually creates situations such as heartburn. And the stomach, when it is eased, the movements are so much more placid, calming, welcoming. There's less acidity around and the food is able to be digested easily. And this is how we are digesting our life. The food goes from the stomach into the duodenum. And the duodenum, of course, then goes past the liver. How we are stomaching life also depends on what we are dishing up. Are we dishing up what we are doing with joy, with pleasure, happiness, or are we doing it begrudgingly? Because it's going to affect the stomach as well. So it really is very important as to how we are dishing things up to ourselves and to other people. A lot of people say they have a lot on their plate. What are they talking about? They're talking about what they need to do. But then look at what they've got on their plates as well. How is it being dished up? How has it been stomached? And often people say, I am so fed up. Fed up with what? Fed up with the discourtesy, fed up with all the discontent. The other way of dealing with it, of course, is to be appreciative and full of gratitude. Gratitude for the opportunity to become better at being ourselves. And that we can only do by doing what is our sole desire. And then, of course, there's the fear of the consequences. When we don't do things properly or we do things to upset other people, then the body again is going to react accordingly, particularly the digestive organs.
The fear of eating, which doesn't affect too many people, can come from our memories and our belief systems. The interesting thing is that many of the foods are the same shape as organs of the body. And so we can also then realize what it is that the person is fearing. If they have a particular dislike and can't take certain things in, then we can look at the types of food. This is particularly important when it comes to allergies. The foods are symbolic of what is going on in life, and that is what upsets the digestion. Burping and wind is very much an emotional thing. When we keep swallowing and swallowing our emotions, eventually they have to find a way out. And of course, when we are full of emotions, it is very, very hard to swallow. We feel strangulated and life becomes very distasteful to us. The liver problems, again, are caused very much by what happened in the past. We're seeing an increase in gastritis, ulcers and diabetes. Any itis in the body is inflammation. And where does that inflammation come from? The energy in this area is fire. We generate the fire through what we do. And when we get furious and inflamed, then the body starts getting overheated and starts developing an infection, just to show where the problem is. It's knowing where the particular organ is. So for example, gastritis would be anger and frustration at what they're having to do or what's being done to them. Ulcers is eating away at what is going on. Ulcers don't just happen in the digestive tract. They can also appear on legs and other parts of the body, such as the mouth. Diabetes, we'll talk about just now when we look at the pancreas. Irritable bowel syndrome. This now comes into the communication relationship area. And it's when a person is very irritated that they cannot get moving. They cannot meet their goals or they're put under pressure, particularly people like sportsmen and sportswomen. So even though it's the communication relationship area, it is connected to the food as well. When there's a lot of objection and obstacles, this can cause problems in the bowel area. It doesn't allow the food through and can cause a blockage. Any blockage in the body comes from family and society. You can't do that. You mustn't do that. No, no, it's not good for you. So it's what we buy into that we analyze, process, digest, and so on. And as I said, many of the foods look like parts of the body. You can take it a step further when it comes to allergies, reaction to food, dislike of food. Now we can look at the colors. A lot of children say, I don't like my greens. Now it's not the greens they don't like, i.e. the vegetables. It's actually something to do with mum. Maybe she's vegetating. Or maybe she's so emotional that they cannot digest what's going on. They cannot stomach that. So they find it difficult to take greens on board. Then there's the fruits. Many people dislike fruit or cannot eat it. Fruits are connected to the fruits of our labor. And it's the type of fruit that causes bad reactions that gives us an indication. For example, an apple. Apple is a fruit, but it can come in the color green or red or even yellow. So we look at the apple as the fruit, but we can take it a step further into the realms of green being emotional, red being family and society, yellow being actions and reactions. Sometimes a dislike of apples is because we were not the apple of our father's eye. A lot of issues with grains. Grains are very much to do with the harvesting, the rewards from what we do. And grains are essential. People who cannot tolerate cereals and grains are usually finding something intolerable within their communication relationships. And then finally, we have the root foods. These are very much linked to the family roots, society roots. And then you can take that whole concept a bit further. There are certain foods that are linked to countries. For example, in Ireland, they grow potatoes. Potatoes is almost the staple diet. So when a person finds it very difficult to stomach potatoes, you could always take the question into Ireland. Is there any connection with Ireland? It's amazing what stories could come out. I asked the Americans, what is the staple diet in America? Can you guess? Hamburgers. The pancreas, of course, maintains a sugary balance in the body. And sugar, another word for sugar, happiness, joy, pleasure. But what can the pancreas do 
if a person's not deriving any joy, pleasure and happiness from what they're doing, where can it get it from? So then it cannot function. This is why we're seeing so much diabetes and pancreatic cancer on the planet. So many people are dragging their feet into work. They're bitching and moaning about what's going on there. They're absolutely miserable about what they're having to do. Meanwhile, the pancreas is calling out for joy and pleasure. Just enjoy what you're doing. Then I can get on with my job. And substance abuse comes when we're having to fill the gaps. Humans do not like voids in their lives. They're always wishing to fill those gaps. And we've briefly spoken about that already. And it shows how we are handling life. It also gives us a clue what is actually missing in their life. If it's cigarettes, then there's something to do with the emotional aspect. What are they depriving themselves of? If it's food, it's a lack of satisfaction and pleasure from what they're doing. If it's alcohol, it's the lack of spirit in their life. Now, the spleen is situated just under the rib cage on the left hand side, and it's in line with the little toe and the fourth toe, and it's in the area of intellect. So, it's what we think we should be doing within our family and society to please them. The spleen is affected by the disease to please. It swells quite a bit when people have malaria. What causes malaria? The female infected mosquito. And what does she do? She sucks blood. Ever heard of that expression? Of people sucking your blood? And women particularly can identify with this. So what is going on in this person's life? When there's issues with spleen, it's also to do with obsession. Being obsessive about the way things must be done or not done. We can also understand allergies, intolerances and fears through our feet. An allergy is when we are too tolerant or not tolerant at all of a memory or a belief system. And we react badly when we come into contact with something that reminds us of that. It can be the thought of something. It can be the sight of something. Now again, interesting enough with allergies, it affects the senses first. So when it affects the eyes, straight away we know that it's to do with the emotions. Something is going on at a deeper level. It can be the smell of something. When it affects the nose and it keeps dribbling, it's something to do with what's been done and not been done. The ears, that again is what they have heard. Then we have the mouth. This is to do with communications, relationships. Does a person react badly with ulcers or herpes or anything that affects the mouth? Then the jawline, of course, is to do with family and society. Another way of looking at allergies is looking at all the suppressed urges we have in life that make us react badly. And what do we mean when we say react badly? Why do we react badly? What is going on at a deeper level? What is the memory? What is the belief system? Further clues as to what we're reacting badly to. So for example, if we react badly to feathers, feathers rely on the air to move. So this is again linked to the emotions. If people react badly to anything with feathers, anything that flies in the wind, then of course it's something to do with their emotional aspect. When they have allergies to warm-blooded animals, horses, dogs, cats, the memory or belief is linked to some action. If they have allergies, for example, to pigs, it could be somebody who ate like a pig, who distressed them when they were a child, or behaved like a pig. There's so many sayings that we use, and then if we use these sayings and look back at our childhood and say, OK, I do remember so-and-so. And then if we go back to that time and see why it's so challenging that that person was behaving like a dog, then of course we can then do something about it, change the memory, realize it's not happening anymore. We do not have to react badly. Anything from the water, fish allergies, for example, quite common particularly shellfish. Now, if you think about shellfish, the fish is actually covering itself up. And what people don't like is possibly because of some fishy business that has been covered up within the relationship or a lot of selfishness. Anything along those lines, I'm just giving a few ideas of what the story can be. So dislike or allergies to fish is often linked to fishy business. 
Then we have animals and creatures that live on the ground. The fear of snakes, for example. Was there a snake in the grass hiding when you got home from school that abused you? That was one of the stories of one of my students. There are so many different stories and it's important to find out what the story is for that person because we all have had different backgrounds. When it comes to metals, the irony of it all is actually it's linked to the mentality. One of the greatest allergies is to iron. Iron represents strength. So why is this person reacting to iron in the way they are? Why are some people needing extra iron? Maybe it's because they're lacking the strength within. Where are they going to get that strength? From themselves. So when again we're looking at metals, look at what was going on in the mind of the person. What was happening at that time? So the way to decide what an allergy is all about is to go back to when it started. What was going on in that person's life at that time? How did they react? And where in the body did they react? Then you can start asking the questions to start piecing the story together. Many people develop allergies according to the season, with the well-known one being, of course, springtime, spring fever, hay fever. Again, it's not to do with the weather. The weather highlights what's going on inside us. Reflexology and reflexology are fantastic at allowing the person to become more tolerant of what is going on externally. No matter the weather, they can keep that smile on their dull. Taking that a step further, spring is symbolic of new beginnings. Summer is symbolic of the fruits, autumn, the harvest, and winter, the roots. One of the reasons people have developed so many allergies with gluten intolerance and cereal intolerance is because that is the outcome of our actions. That is when we reap the rewards from what we are doing. And if we're not doing what we really should be doing, and we're not reaping the rewards that we are expecting, we become a little intolerant and it affects our communication relationships. In the olden days, if you did not have bread on the table, the chances of survival were very, very slim. Now, in those days, the bread was made out of just wheat. Listen to the word wheat. We eat. So if we don't have wheat on the table, then we're going to starve. So wheat became an essential ingredient to survival. And when a person develops an intolerance in this area, it's because the essential ingredient in their communication relationships is missing, and they cannot tolerate that. They cannot therefore fully digest what is going on in their life when they take in their grains. So again, to understand allergies to food, let's look at the fruits and the foods. One of the most amazing stories I heard was a girl who had an allergy to avocado. Now, if you cut an avocado in half, the shape is the same as the uterus. But avocado is a fruit, yet its color is green. So it is also linked to the emotions. So I asked her, do you know what happened when you were in your mother's womb? She said, yes, my mother tried to abort me. She would stick knitting needles up into her womb. And of course, the question to ask then is why was she having to do it? She didn't know, so she went back and asked her mother and her mother explained her circumstances at that time and said it wasn't because she didn't want the child, it was because she was too poor to actually support her. Once the girl knew the story, her allergies to avocado miraculously disappeared. So regardless of our allergies, intolerances and fear, the show must go on. We can't give up now. I mean, there's just too much to live for. So remember, there are no excuses. It's time to get on and do what you came to do in the first place. But where on earth are you going to get your energy from? Forget about the vitamins and all the minerals that we start pumping into our bodies. If the universal God wanted us to have them, he would have provided them at birth. And he did interesting enough in the body itself. We create our own vitality. We create our vitamin B when we are being ourselves to the full, being our authentic selves. We create our vitamin A when we're putting our ideas into action. Our vitamin C, that's a big one communication relationships and all the various minerals just have a closer look and see what is going on in your life 
why are you having to supplement what is already there? So when it comes to reflexology and reflexology, we're going to look at the third toes to see what the person has in mind. The right third toe is very much to do with ideas that they had in the past. The left third toe is to do what the ideas they have now. In the days before computers and the internet, we used to use what we would call snail mail and faxes. Some of you may remember those. And I received a fax of a picture of a foot from New Zealand where the third toe was missing. The other toes were superb. They were long, long toes. These toes belonged to a lady in Hamilton, which is very much an agricultural, was very much a farming area. And this lady obviously had ideas that were way beyond everybody else. Her thoughts extended way beyond farming. And interesting enough, she lost that third toe when she was mowing the lawn. Again, green emotions. But interesting enough, that is to do with doing. So she obviously wasn't doing what she needed to do with her emotions. I was going to Hamilton to give a presentation and the organizer contacted me and said, this lady would like to come but she's not sure whether she'd like to come. Now that's interesting because if you don't have a toe to think with, then you can't make your mind up. Anyway, eventually I said, look, let her come. I was doing it over three days and I said, look, if she doesn't like it, she could just leave. Well, the interesting thing was that by the end of the three days, she was the last to leave. And after the seminar and the presentation, her toe started to regrow because now she was doing something with those magnificent, incredible ideas. Also, look at the position of the third toe. If it's in front of the second toe, maybe they're doing so much that they don't want to get in touch with their feelings. They don't want to think about how they feel. If it's behind the fourth toe, they're all talk and no action is likely to be. Then going down into the various parts of the feet, looking at the markings, the lines, the swellings. The liver swells when it's overwhelmed. It will even exceed the boundaries and that, interesting enough, is also the elbow reflex. And the elbow reflex will also extend when the person needs more space to get on and do things. There's also the spleen that may swell when obsessive. There's the lines to look at sometimes. Where do they start? Where do they finish? Start in the family, communications, doing, finish in the stomach. It means that they're either feeling tied to the family, communications, what they're doing, or they're concerned. There's so many aspects. Just look at the lines. What are they saying to you? The feet speak fantastic language. There are other things to look at. Is the instep invading the balls of the feet? In which case, the person is possibly too busy doing things that it's taking over their emotions. They can't feel, they don't want to feel. Or are the feelings conversely invading the space of doing and getting in the way? Are the emotions getting in the way of what should be done? There are so many things to look at. The stature of the feet is affected by what we are doing, the direction of which we are going. When we are walking, the feet should be directly parallel and pointing ahead. If they start turning outwards, then they are becoming increasingly accommodating. They are taking possibly on too much. They may be too considerate of other people to the detriment of themselves. So encourage people who walk like that to straighten their feet. Also, when they lie down on the couch or on the bed and their feet flop out, just gently embrace those feet and encourage them to stand up. It changes the energy immediately. The other thing that happens is that when we are talking, our feet will show the area of interest. We will turn our back onto those we're not interested in but we'll open our feet to embrace those we are. So if you really want to get somebody's attention and you've got something important to say, make sure you're between their two feet. The last thing to do, particularly with men rushing out to work, the wife saying, remember to buy some milk and bread on the way home? You may as well forget it because his feet are pointing in the wrong direction. Tell him whilst his feet are in front of you. When we are being our authentic selves and we're doing what we came to do, we just blossom and bloom and life is wonderful. In between the doing and the communication relationship come the kidneys. The two kidneys are placed differently in the body. 
The right kidney is slightly lower and more central because of the liver, and the left one is just under the solar plexus. The job of the kidneys is to filter through the blood to take away worked through thoughts and emotions. These then form the urine and then are expelled from the body because they are no longer of use. What the kidneys do not like is disillusionment or disappointment. And when people are constantly disillusioned or disappointed by life events, the kidneys start playing up. Interesting enough, some people are born with three kidneys and you can see these quite clearly on the feet. And some maybe with just one, but it's more common to have two, obviously. As you well know, some family members are able to donate a kidney. That is because they are processing similar family, familiar issues. If a kidney is transplanted and it does not have the same issues, then it will be rejected. Going back to those three kidneys, that goes back to a family that has a lot of unfinished business that needs to be processed. This is also why some people drink their urine, particularly if they're arthritic. Arthritic people tend to be art righteous people. They have very rigid ways of thinking. So what they have to do is they have to run the whole thing through the system again. Remember, this is not about judging. There is no right. There is no wrong. It's what helps a person and understanding that urine is actually very, very healing. If you're stranded on a desert island, you can drink your own urine to survive. It has incredible healing properties and it's used in a lot of cosmetics. So here's a thought, especially in the morning. It has a lot of minerals and vitamins. It's superb for the complexion. And I kid you not that when there are issues with the kidney, it's often childlike behavior. It's not fair stamping their feet. They've got more than I have. Childlike behavior upsets the kidneys, unless you're a child, of course. It's when you're an adult and acting this way. It comes from that disappointment, that disillusionment that we were talking about. When it comes to massaging the digestive reflexes, attention is first given to the liver, pancreatic, and spleen reflexes. Since the liver, by processing past events, extracts and stores energy and the know-how for current affairs. The pancreas endeavors to provide a pleasant internal environment by extracting joy and happiness from prior events to enhance and reassure the intake. Then the spleen is reassured that it's okay to be oneself and act with authenticity. Then lovingly massage the mouth, throat, and esophagus reflexes to ease the transformation of the new intake coming from fresh life experiences from the outer environment to be digested in the inner world. Massaging the digestive reflexes makes it so much easier to stomach and process what is going on or not going on, allowing the most beneficial aspects to be extracted from life's events for personal well-being. By helping to process past energy through reflexology, space becomes available for the creation of a peaceful, creative, and cooperative environment allowing the whole to be re-energized and fired with the passion and enthusiasm required to achieve the soul's purpose on earth. So what is the answer other than reflexology and reflexology? Is to act spontaneously, not from fear-based experiences, but to experiment more, find out what you can do, and stop thinking about what you can't do. There is so much life to be lived. Enjoy. If you'd like to explore this more, please go to my website www.alwaysbewithoutthee.com where you will find information on the nine books that I have already written on the subject of reflexology, channeling and the language of the feet as well as the emotional and spiritual aspects. Remember, healing and health are only two feet away.